these are prescription slip out. Half of it is screen erase. It's not like I'm committed to it. You need your glasses a lot. Because yeah. I think when you first this started at UWM, you had sunglasses. <laughs> 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 well, I always these. I always have these. This coming from California, never never don't have problems. Man, these things. Do different. you? I need new glass sunglasses. These are disgusting. Do you have a uh, insurance you know, through your university? I do, and I, but you only get one pair of glasses per year. Right. And that's the one I just lost. I literally have no idea where they are. I gotta go buy a new pair. Yeah, I know. I was on the thing, and like, ah, I can't even, can't even cough up the copay for glasses anymore. I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call in the, uh, the big guns and ask my mom to buy me a, a couple new pairs of glasses because oh. we can't afford them. Well, if your mom's watching. <laughs> She's in Portugal right now. Oh, cool. Are we online? Yeah, we're online. Uh, now everyone knows who my mom is. <laughs> <laughs> Our 900 viewers. Uh, Just a lost person from Florida wandering around Portugal. That's my mom. <laughs> How do you identify someone from <laughs> Florida? <sighs> they can, they're wearing a lot of pastels. <laughs> Pastel. You know, I had a dream about Florida last night, oddly enough, and it involved a pool full of alligators. And that's that's about it. Um, I have an aunt and uncle that live there, and I've been down a couple times. I, I kind of like Florida, but I've only, only been in like decent. I've only been in November uh -huh. and March. It's not. I don't care what time you go. Uh, it's the politics of Florida. I mean, oh, that, that, um, that you can't. That might change. Yeah, you can't swing a highlight ticket without hitting a. Uh, Used gun store. Um, it's it's crazy. To be fair to my mom, she's not a Floridian by. She she moved down there to be closer to the family. Um, I don't know too many Floridians who are from Florida. Her sister's been, well. Her sister's not from there, but she's been in the Tampa area, which okay. is kind of like a liberal enclave in Florida. And where? Tampa. Tampa. Oh, yeah, the Tampa nice. Bay area is pretty. If you have to be in Florida, Tampa's. I really like Tampa. Been in Orlando, sorry, e Igor, Jeremy. Igor City. Oh, Orlando's a oh, it's a, that's. Someone must have written about like the hyper, realism of Orlando, and I haven't even been. I've only been to like Universal. My aunt and uncle that live down there. Um, we've been a, we've been to Universal a couple times now, and it's <coughs> very interesting. I'll be the first to admit when we walk into that Harry Potter world. And I'm not even a Harry Potter uh -huh. fan. I well up. Because that's just like every... I mean, you're talking about playing Ultima. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's... A, it, um, yeah, so I'm noticing now that the camera is not even facing me, and I'm all right with that's that. That's fine. I just want to point out that this, this screen image right now is the most, like, surreal thing I've ever seen. That out of context, this looks like an installation piece. Um, I think I might give you a little... Yeah, well, well, I mean, I see some of this junk on the walls here. This was something along those lines. Like, there there are some, like, the interfaces are so well designed. And, like, some of the happenstance moments like that one, they're just so cool. What are you talking about? So you like, like this, yeah. like what you were saying. Are you sure you don't want to play? Shy to do. I was about to say. <coughs> Maybe this is too late. God, not you. I'm sorry. So, what is my destination here? So, uh, oh. that was Trinsic that we just. Thought. So, I'll trade my guns for video. Oh, hey Nick, what's going on? Um, sorry, I got. There we go. Hey Nick, how you doing? Um, sorry, I'm a little late. We're a little late answering. So what were you saying? Oh, where were we going? Should I sit over there so I can see the? Am I gonna be on camera if I sit over there? Yeah, probably. Oh, well, it's it's over here. So no, not over there. 
I forgot to bring my map. Oh my goodness, Nick. We are being obstinate uh, avoiders of the camera. Yeah. Because we're just people. So I was going down the coast, is that right? Yeah, I was going to say if you go. Um, oh, no. Trying to get the general reference of each of the cities that we're going to see. But again, I think our, our made a game uh, motivation here is to. Probably kill Apshai so that we can have It heightens the intrigue by us not having our favorite. I'm sorry? <clears throat> it heightens the intrigue by us not having our favorite. Yeah. Good spell components and double fulls. What does that mean? Does that mean we can. Oh, that no, spells no. have more effective when a double full? Or does that mean that there's more. I don't know what that means. There's more spell components available? Moon glow, see. There's nothing quite like having this audience know much more about this game than we probably do. Despite the fact that I've played this game <coughs> for hundreds of hours and never seen a dungeon. Have we been to Moon Glow before? No, we have not. How have you been, Nick? Yes. Well, come on now. Back in my day, you would just heal automatically at an inn. <laughs> First edition Dungeons and Dragons, after eight hours of uh, healing, you revive one hit point. So the next thing that the moon phases tend to reflect what spell components are available. Do you mean in stores or also like out in the the boonies? See, I didn't. I did not know that. Described as an insane person, is that correct? The moons are enemies. <laughs> Damn existentialist. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we answer this question, um, what you know, what um, what virtues come into play here? Is there one for truth? Um, There's humility, right? Is it better to believe the story? Truth. Truth is a truth is a virtue, right? Yeah. So, yeah, we should probably say no, right? Is truth a virtue? Go. Nick's pointing us to. <coughs> I'm going to consult with the official book of Ultima. I don't know why. It's been used as a uh, buffer for the microphone for several months now. I might as well. What are the virtues? I think this is strange. The fact that our stream is just showing two empty chairs while we talk is 
somehow befitting. Yeah, whatever. It's like a Clint Eastwood uh, political speech. So no. Yeah, I say no. Okay. Huh. So Nick has pointed us to a uh, web page here uh, where you can find about spells and reagents, which yeah, that's his key game. So this is magic. So we have oh, magical shit. herbs yeah. here. So here we can get components. And this, again, is where we don't want to buy anything because we're going to try to kill Apshai so that we... Oh, shit, yeah, sure, man. Really? Why are we killing Apshai? Because it's less money to get them... Get, I, if we run into... It, she is a her. Um, then paying for the healing costs. Unless we have a ton of gold. Eh, not really. I create, so, okay, so Moon Glow is honesty. But I wonder if you lose That's anything the virtue. from. Um, do you lose anything from uh, dying? You do. That's why we're saying don't buy magical herbs because you lose equipment. But we don't have much in the way of equipment. No. <clears throat> I mean, I think at some point when we're a little bit higher and we've got more gold. Hold on. Remember, there is no tear in threats. Does the strive to be honest? Yes. One thing, another idea I was thinking of for the upcoming Global Game Jam is a uh, riff off of Ultima, this Ultima game. It'd be a little bit easier to. Question here is not more than honesty. I think what we should do. Well, one day get really drunk and write down a lot of these sayings and then go get them tattooed somewhere. Too late. Already done. <laughs> <laughs> In that font, of course. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and then see how the font, like, <laughs> just morphs over time. <laughs> I don't want to have one that's just a full conversation. Do you believe that I am true? <laughs> oh, my God. Your tattoo's gone papyrus. No! <laughs> <laughs> ah, graphic designer humor. <laughs> oh, man. You know, I think a fun thing to do with this game would literally be to do some type of browning. So is everybody named after... Well, Darren Nord's not a writer. A twine gamer, and you search the internet for clues for your Ultima game. I was just thinking of taking all of these <laughs> conversations and making out a, an amazing poem out of all of the conversations in this thing. Um, it would be cool to make a Twitter bot. That, a Twitter bot that just came up with like the things that these NPCs say. That would be awesome. Ultima 4 bot. Next says, a twine game where you search the internet for clues for your Ultima games. That's not bad. You know, it's... It, it, I've been struggling with a project that I, I was reviewing, a Twine interpretation of Fallout 2. <laughs> and I'm I'm kind of struggling with it, but I don't want to get it. But it, it's... I mean, not to, to dish on Twine, it's a wonderful thing. But no, I, oh, Twine. Oh, Ty, oh, no. yeah, it's, sure. It's often... I, I feel like it's given more... Anyway, I don't want to get into it. I like Twine for what it is. I mean, I, I think it's a wonderful, wonderful project. Well, Fallout games are terrible. What, well, this was Fallout 2, so it's a little bit different. Are we talking about the... I love the first Fallout. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 Fallout, newer, yeah. the newer ones are whatever, but... Can't or you won't. Make sure you ask in Mantra Rune on everyone. Been better. Well, I guess if he's here. Magic herbs. I mean, something a little different than 2018 would have been. We did 1985. I am Margot. 
So she's going to offer a bunch of reagents. Um, Should we buy some? Can we cast spells? That's the, well, that's what she's got available. It's just ginseng and garlic, which, uh, if I'm not mistaken, are the two components to the healing spell. Oh, no, it's showing us what we have. We currently have ginseng and garlic, so we're just a little bit away from making a strange souffle. Uh, sulfurous ash. That's a nice curry. In the works. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting to hear Nick's falling while he, while he hits the falling things. Um, I mean, if you want to buy some, it's good. Like I said, I, I get the feeling that it, we don't have enough gold really to, heal, to resurrect Apshai, so I feel like we're heading for the cemetery soon. Let me see. Uh, I'm not going to write down what reagents are available. Maybe I should. Are you sure you don't want to? We'll sure. see how much it is. Are you in need of help? The death might give it away. <laughs> uh, the the body swarms <laughs> over the. One of us is a corpse. Three hundred. I mean, if you want, see, that's what I mean. Like, well, I could go and you can walk around and I pick some. Go fight something. Yeah. I mean, we're. That's the thing about these moon gates. You kind of commit to. Yeah. Let's see if I can. Maybe there's a. Someone here is a, a joiner. Who's a joiner? Nope. So Mariah. Oh, can so Mariah can join, but we're still neophytes. So ask her what her well, sh oh mage. Do the whole job mantra rune thing. I hadn't followed up. I didn't twine comment. I uh, I did, I did write it. Long twine. Went to a class I took with my friend Sam. I, uh, <clears throat> as an old person, I much prefer in form because I like my parser based fictions. Mm -hmm. But I realize that learning in form takes 10,000 more hours than twine does, which you can do rather quickly. Yeah, I like in form. Um, that's what I want to do for the game. You want to do an informed game for the future? I'd love to. Yeah. But I wouldn't mind doing RPG Maker too. Well, when is he going to be down there? That might, make, that might be worth a road trip. Are uh, people from north of the border welcome? I don't know why I'm shouting. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's farther. Folks. He's, he's, <laughs> Nick is actually outside. We're shouting out to... <laughs> someone's talking to... Folks that don't understand English, where they have a couple. Yeah, maybe. That would be, uh. We're talking, yeah, we're probably representing the two people that most interested in interactive fiction here. I, I bet, uh, As far as text based interactive fiction. Nick, have you met Dan Cox at all? Again, I'm yelling. <laughs> Every time I speak to somebody that's on this, I'm going to choose an, an accent. Just the other day, 
very much in sync different, very, very different fields. Who's in your uh, Stuart, Jocelyn, and Roberto? Oh, awesome. I've never taken a class with uh, Jocelyn, but uh, Stuart had recommended her. Uh, but just the other day, I was looking up at the recent winners of the ZZ and the IF Interactive Fiction Contest Awards, and I was realizing I haven't played any of those games now in like five years. I'm so behind. The Witch. I just never really cared for them. It seems like they have a cool. So, which game? The, well, you know, they have these, I mean, if you want to stay on top of the interactive fiction community, and you, you know, I, I don't know why I'm sounding like I'm an expert on this, you know, staying on top of, like, the competitions always seems to be the way to do it. They've, there's three major competitions, the interactive fiction competition, the Zizzy one, um, and then, and then um, Aaron Reed runs now the Spring Thing, which is now another interactive fiction competition for, like, novels or larger, oh, like, cool. um, interactive fiction thing. But my point was, I haven't played any of the winners of any. She used to try to always play the winners, the top one every year, and I haven't in like five years. Uh, it was great to see that still, you know, I thought maybe it would be all twine now, but there's still quite a bit of Parsha stuff. And I wonder if he's the twine. I don't know. I don't. Is there a major twine competition that I don't know of? Because um, I do feel sometimes like these IF societies are still kind of Parsha based folks. Twine competition. I don't know. I don't even know if a tw if the, the a competition would be in the blood of twine communities. <laughs> and it seems very. I mean, fortunately, it's it seems adamantly opposed opposed to a lot of conventions that are. Did Nick mention the Martin Luther Jam? Is that a twine or not? Sorry, I didn't interrupt you. I was just curious. Is, is that a twine or just a... Oh, it's a game about... Huh. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, the, the fact that twine has this kind of democratic indie ethos. You can't nail uh, twine games to doors, though. <laughs> Yeah, th so I think the Lacam here is just, this is a um, we have found, and I should have. This isn't really a. This is near Moonglow, I'm going to write. It's like north. Northwest, right? Yeah. Let's see. Let's see. This is a like an observatory. I remember being here when I played this game last time. Ah, uh, see? Yes, we do. Gate? <laughs> Scott's redeeming himself <laughs> in his in his eyes. <laughs> I think I just want to kind of I can't try. Oh, this isn't the hidden village. In teleport? Northwood. Isn't it teleport? Try g ask him gate. What's his name? Oh, we need the three. Oh, say no. Say yes. Or try, try Mentorian, but I think, I do think, uh, now, or actually, M-E-N, and then the rest of the way you had it right, T-O-R-I-N. I am Nigel. Folks, this is why I have to transcribe these notes into an Excel document. That, that's searchable. Number times hammered equals zero times created believer. <laughs> so let me key that. What was his, his name? Was what was the name of the dude who had a special spell? I have the naming conventions of some of these names. You know, Brown in some places. Now we're talking to Starfire. Who wasn't that a Decepticon? So it's, an, it's a living corpse? Now can you go to the end and say... And
stranger than there. I get the feeling this is a good place to come back when we've gotten some hints. Yeah, I don't. I think it's worth doing. Don't get me wrong, but I get the feeling we're not going to find anything here because this is not a place that is uh, associated with any virtue. Yeah. Thanks, dude. <laughs> oh, I've lost uh, coolness. That should be a virtue. Yes, I know we're coming down from over there. <laughs> I, I forgot about that. That's hysterical. I, that's, I'm sorry, but that's just wonderful. <laughs> that's that's your telescope. That is correct. <laughs> Here in my telescope. Ah, here we go. Search there. By the end, thou shalt find a knob. This is dirty. Okay. Um, sorry, sorry, sorry. This is a full book, right? The um. Yeah. So this gives us a map of each of the towns, or that looks like that looks like uh, Britannia. Britannia, right? Yeah, because that's the. So this can tell us where secret shiznit is, right? Yeah. Like you can see up there on the upper left hand side of the screen by the upper left balustrade, that's the that's the door to the dungeon that we found. Remember? Mm -hmm. Of course, we've already found it, so it's it's not. But that would be helpful. I don't think <laughs> you're talking about. No. <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. All right, yeah. Um, let me, let me Do you have to search again? For a yeah. Uh, Palomar. No, uh, we Wisconsinites don't uh, talk about such things. like the observatory. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You know what I would love to do? Is it possible to uh, screenshot these? Is that a pain in the ass? Um. Because these would be good for to print out and then have in the folder for, the, for kids first see. I could screenshot it, but would need to open up Photoshop and that yeah. would reduce the window. No um, else. We can do it a little ugly. Or I think we'll probably just get online and copy the image from somebody else that has posted it on the internet. That would be good if you like the internet. That's true. You have, I, you have, to, admi <laughs> you have to admit that the internet has value. We're <laughs> Nick, we're playing the uh, good old games version. So this okay. is, I think this is Ultima 4 being run through uh, probably DOSBox. And which is why we don't have cool Commodore 64 music. So well, let me list. So A is Britannia. B is the Lipan. What's C? Um. What is that? That's Britannia as well, I think. Are you sure? It look. Cause <sighs> that's the throne room. But it's got that same, and that's the courtyard in the back. We haven't been able <coughs> to get to that courtyard because the door is locked. That courtyard looks like, you know, the stones around the... All right, so we're going to say, I'm going to put Britannia in quotes. 
Yeah, because that's I think that's the throne room. Wait, not Britannia. It's the castle. It's the castle Britannia, right? Because there's an actual Britannia next door. Control F five. Where's that going? The problem is if I, I don't think I don't you'd know. have to flip to paste it into somewhere. Unless it creates the the file automatically. Cause it, I, oh, is if so, the emulator should have a screenshot button. Should have a screenshot to a folder on the computer. Oh, should, cool. Yeah. All right. Oh, what's D? What is that? Now, does that look more like the throne room? This is the fighting. Remember, there's like a, a one of those places has a fighting area. So, this is still Castle Britannia? Maybe. All right. This goes all the way to P? Let's do it P. That's what I get for not. Magencia? No, that's one of the. That's got to be a um, the end, maybe. That went a lot of order. So, oh, that was so. Oh, I'm sorry, that one was. Oh, that was P. So this is E. I'm at a loss. Are these? Is this? Wait, wait, wait. Hold on. Is that a Brit? No, because I'm. Uh, the is it Moon Glow? No. I I this think has to be a city. This has yeah. to be a city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I am saving you. Okay. Um, that's intrinsic, maybe, because that's where the mm -hmm. kid is roasting marshmallows. Yeah, we'll save all these. And, and even if that doesn't work, I'm gonna grab them and print them because I think this is this will be helpful as we wander through each of these towns, and then we can match up each of these things to make sure that we have visited every town. That one looks like a walled city. You know, we've taken a lot of digs at Ultima Four, but man, there's some things about it that I love. What was the purpose of coding this? Was this? I mean, it, was this so you would know like where secrets are? Why why do this? Why have this telescope that gives you a, a bird's eye view of this area? I think it is for because the secret doors are indicated. And I wonder. I mean, I'm not a coder, and I'm curious how. I'm curious how this was programmed. Like, were these images that he made, or is it reflecting? I, I don't I don't know how to phrase my question correctly. Pixel by pixel. That reminds me of. Don't question Lord Bird. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now we need to play Car Wars or not Car Wars. All the auto duel games for one of these streams. Jen can't pop through. Yeah, it's fine. Linger for just. I don't know, man. It just must have been a really fun game to make. For somebody, I you know, when I was this age, I was see, and this looks like. That is Magencia. Yeah, because it's yeah. a bridge. And you can see how everything's kind of hacked to pieces. Yeah. You know, you're missing walls. And for all of the ridiculousness of this game, I'm having a, I, I'm just having a hard time. What do you mean by fantasy console? Like, hmm. what what do you mean by fantasy consoles? Yeah. My Xbox One X is a fantasy console. It's pretty. I don't have one. Um, Your Xbox what? One X. Is that the new one? <laughs> 
just a fancy super version. But I mean, I was just gonna say, you know, I was playing. I I was much more into Wizardry and Bard's Tale, and I do think that's probably because Wizardry and Bard's Tale were easy to access for the way that I thought when I was. Now, what the hell is that? Like, I don't think we've had a town that had a wall on the outside. Then he came in, and there was another walled area. Pyco Eight is a fantasy console for making, sharing, and playing tiny games and other things. Oh, I'm having an insult. I have to check that out. That's cool. Huh, I didn't even heard of it. Hmm. Is it like a Raspberry Pi? Interesting. I've been wanting to get one of those Pi consoles for a while. We had talked about making one. Um, I had tried, I can't remember what the version of it was, but it was on like my, I grabbed my wife's old laptop and threw it on there. It was up here for a while, but. Nick is saying I'm teaching a course on introductory game programming right now. Oh, awesome. Oh, thanks for sharing that. That's fantastic. <laughs> Actually, seeing a few, few more jobs than I expected on game development and I'm feeling sorely lacking in a lot of those skills. Hey, we did, did we ever see P? Oh, yeah, P was the final. It's taught by Noah Ward Bruin. Oh, wow. I think Mark Marino is over at Santa Cruz, too. No, he's at the USC. Not the oldest thing? And that's USC. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, USC is where my wife got her master's degrees. That's no way. Santa Cruz is up in, you know, an hour outside the Bay Area. And it's beautiful. But it's beautiful out here, too. Do you uh, anticipate, would you return to California if you had a chance? I think that uh, we're going to the West Coast as soon as I'm done. But we're, we're talking about Seattle. Oh, nice. So, so truth is a principle. Oh, very, sorry. Haven't we heard this before? Meditate. At each shrine, so this is not just for one shrine, for one, two, and three minutes. So that's the pattern. Then shalt thou know the results. Then shalt thou know the paths of good of goodness. C S E why that's too many SEs. Is it you know is US C S C the US Space Force? Because <laughs> if they're hiring that that would be pretty cool. Santa Cruz. <laughs> Santa Cruz is man, that's such a they don't have a they don't have a doctoral program though. Because they're a state school. If I'm if I'm not Oh no! Wait, they do have a doctoral program because that's. I'm sorry. Uh, no worries, Nick. I didn't know that they're hiring. What are they hiring for? Actually, state meditation. 
Yeah, we've been, that's been our, we look at California as kind of the, and the uh, Pacific Northwest, yeah. especially, because I was there, I've been there a few times over the last couple of years, and I just keep coming back with this, like, these magical stories, like Sarah Weep, and that's my wife's name. Mm -hmm. You, it's just amazing. I, I, I can't, but it's tough to kind of go say you know sight unseen and because we've done that before and it's been somewhat of a problem no we can yeah I mean it's not we, <coughs> we have a longer conversation about we've had yeah we came here sight unseen didn't know anything about Wisconsin I do have relatives in Madison it's not it's not bad here I mean I honestly I'm, I'm really comfortable in it there, there is a jarring effect because it's so it it, it is there, there's a sense to it that you don't really get a taste of until you're away from it mm -hmm. and so we went out to the east coast it was very I should say south of the Mason Dixon as well the cultural differences right. were very apparent well again bring it back to our internet conversation about how the internet seems to be driving people into polarization you know polarized communities um, I was just reading election news and it was just talking about the realignment shift in voters. And, you know, 20 years ago, I would never have considered, you know, having to think in terms of like, well, I wouldn't live here. Right. <coughs> That's not an important one. Just because of the type of politics of an area. But now, there's literally states that we would never move to because of the politics of the people that live there. And And I mean, I think that's that's a symptom of the well, polarization currently in American culture. And you know what's interesting about Wisconsin is that you find it's a progressive, it was once a progressive yeah. model and the University of Wisconsin system was one that was um, kind of looked to and now it's seen, I mean, there's nothing like going to a, a, a national conference. It's at, where we were down at Haystack, mm -hmm. Jeff and I, and they called out Wisconsin as being this like pitiful example. <laughs> they were just sitting there like, yeah. <laughs> I was at Gen Con. Really? I was play testing it, um, a really uh, like a um, a cool. I can't remember the name of the game. And I got to talking with the tester. She's like, <laughs> she said, I, I can't remember where she was from. She said, Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 What is yeah. Ace 2018? Yeah, no, Steve Bannon is doing the uh, keynote there. Oh. Bizarre. This is why, yeah. But that seems to, that's, conferences are having a really hard time. I, I, I don't know. I mean, Seas has had political issues. <sighs> Do you I like to talk to Shylock? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nobody else can either, Shylock. And Darby. You need a few of I think that's I think that Shylock's not gonna have an answer no matter how we we spell it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Joke's over. No, it's it was a good joke. Of course. I think that's one of those where someone gives you information to talk to Shiloh.
Shy can uh, fight at zero hit points. Channel. Let's go before we sign off for tonight. And now we want to have a longer conversation about Dave Arneson. Dave Arneson came off with a lot of terrific stuff, uh, including experience points, which we were just talking about. Who was was he on Dead Thieves World or someone affiliated with? Yeah, him. well, there's quite a few names. There's quite a few names. Yeah, he's he's number one Is on he? the list. I think. Um. Well, I mean, I I I think the analogy of Dave Arneson. Is, I was going to say the analysis of Dave Arneson to um, Steve Wozniak and Gary Gygax to Steve Jobs. has a, There's a lot of parallels there. Nobody could have put it together as well as Gary Gygax or certainly sold it as well. Um, but there's also, I mean, I mean, Dave Arneson's, you know, his home campaign was extremely, you know, it didn't, ha it didn't have a lot of, you know, it didn't have a lot of codification on rules. I mean, Gary Gygax was, I think, and I think in many ways, Gary Gygax wanted to codify so many of the rules because he wanted to sell them, right? You can't sell, yeah. be like Dave Arneson, you know? Like, Dave's a good storyteller, sit down and have a great game, but you can't sell that necessarily. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, I, I think Gary kept pushing Dave to come up with rules to understand how he's doing things, and Dave couldn't necessarily explain them. But he did, there were, when I did my research, there was a bunch of interesting, the specific concepts that Dave, and his group in, I think in Minneapolis, if I'm not mistaken. Now there's a link I'm gonna have to check out. I have not seen that, and now I'm really excited to check that out. Nick has posted up a manuscript from, from Arneson. So um, Nick, have you met Nick before? No. Oh, uh, Nick's fantastic. We, um, he's joined us on stream a couple times. Um, used to pop in when I was doing my writing, mm -hmm. streaming, whatever. Uh, but he 
you shared a couple authors that have been fantastic. Uh, you saw them at uh, Michigan a few weeks ago. Oh, cool. So, well, I did my yeah, I, I did my master's thesis on D and D, and I'm sure there's a bulk of you know that my thesis are, represents a bulk of the scholarship between the, the Gary Dave. Um, dynamic, which is that everyone, you know, Guy Gatz gets all the adulation. No one's writing biographies of Arneson. And certainly that's, you know, that's due also to the fact that Arneson was only involved with TS TSR for a little while. Didn't seem to work very well with, with Guy Gatz. Mm -hmm. Didn't like having a corporate job where he had to, and so he kind of moved on. Um, so, you know, you kind of get, people don't necessarily know what you did. There's a lot of uh, pairings like that. Simon and Garfunkel, Hall and Oates, Waz and Dobbs. Yeah. And that's a, that's one of the, but I think that's, yeah. A lot of these things need an ad man, and they need someone who can, is it, uh, well, you know, with, I mean, with, yeah. without jobs, you don't have the adoption of the Apple. Right. Well, I mean, why, they're just hobbyists. These are guys building DNS, <laughs> building cool things on their own until it. You know, for all. For all that, Gary Gygax has taken credit for. I'd be willing to bet that in those Dragon magazines, Arneson's presence is. Very little, if not. Yeah. I mean, Gygax was, out there. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the thing, is Dave was a... I mean, I think Dave always wanted... I'm calling him Dave because, you know, we hung out a lot. Um, <laughs> and I, I think he was happy with having it be his hobby and his game, right? You know what I mean? Um, I don't think that... I mean, I, you know, I don't know. We're, we're making speculation about people. Sure. But I do think... That's what we do as academics, though, right? The, yeah, that's true, yeah. The codification... Like I said, the codification of this this game that you're playing with a bunch of friends on the weekend, it, that's a, it's a hell of a lot of work. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I don't mean to cast spirits on the table, but I don't necessarily want to do that, do that work. You know, it wasn't something that pro it was probably not fun outside of the basement. But Gary absolutely loved it. Um, I mean, it's, it's weird, too, because the games that Guy Gax ran um, tended to be much less free-flowing than the rules he was writing. You know, when you talk about the Dragon Magazine stuff, I think we've talked about this in the D&D &D game that we play on Tuesday nights, is that... You know, people always joke about the Uncle Gary persona because that was always the persona that you have in Dragon Magazine, where he'd be. I mean, he was. He'd get full of himself, talking like as if he represented all of TSR, and yeah. it wasn't a fun Gary to read. It was interesting, but it was always like, you know, this is how you play D and D, and as soon as you vary from too many of these rules, you are no longer playing D and D, and no one will ever like you because yeah. they're, you know, you're now <laughs> playing RuneQuest, and. <laughs> But the fact that his home games, from everything that I've read about his home games, are completely different. You know, at some point he was he never used any. I mean, the, the, the absurd amount of tables and call, you know rules that he came up with, the dungeon master's guide from the tables, the ex very specific elements of insanity to how you know to pay for the tack on your horse. I mean, the, the, the <laughs> tables are, are unbelievable in the dungeon master's guide. I mean, there's literally three hundred pages of stuff that I don't know that anybody has ever used, but he felt that that was necessary. He also felt that it was necessary, I think of the pages of Dragon Magazine, to sell the idea that it was necessary. That the Dungeon yeah. Master's Guide will always have a table or some rule for you no matter what situation they were doing. But if anybody ever did come into a situation where they'd quickly figure out what the land, you know, what the land speed of a galleon was, they would probably make it up on the spot. <laughs> no one was like, all right, everyone, calm down. We're going to find it on page 264. <laughs> of course, the other thing, too, is, you know, the Dungeon Master's Guide was only supposed to be owned by the Dungeon Master of the game. As a matter of fact, it says in the introduction that if you ever catch a player with a Dungeon Master Guide, you know, like, death is too easy a, uh, a you know, a, a solution in that case. You know I mean? Guy Gax is being his tongue-in-cheek. But but that was the idea was the rules of the most of the rules by the player's handbook is a third of the third of the size the first edition of course what I'm talking about oh, third yeah. of the size of the DM's guide and right? half half of it you're is you're not supposed to know the rules yeah. as the player you never were well I mean that's what made uh, computer games so compelling yeah to uh, RPG players because well and there's a good question that we can have a longer conversation with and it's it's two oh six and. I is would do me a favor before we quit. I want to see if if uh, we went up a level. I think we can check it. Oh, out. sure. Captain British. Oh, uh, see.
I know that's why you said Barker, and I was like, that's the guy from Empire of the Petal Throne, responding to Nick here. He's. I'm so happy for your, with some of the information that you that you're given. I, I can't wait to read that manuscript. Um, and I don't know anything about Empire of the Petal Throne except for the person that you mentioned is you know every single image I ever saw of like the first. Uh, First Gen Cons always has him there, Hawk and Empire of the Petal Throne. And I, I don't know anything about it other than it was another system that came out at the same time. What, what the hell was I trying to say? That was That's important. what you're saying. We don't go l up levels automatically. Yeah. Well, no, here's what I'm saying. How do we Whoa! So he can... Oh, we were dead. There you go. I was level four. Which means other nothing other than we can get more people. But it gives us more hit points. Yeah. Abshai slacking. <laughs> Here's my question that I think is, has an interesting academic thought. Do you like it better in a game when you can understand the rules or when they're hidden from you? For instance, Baldur's Gate, one of the things that I kind of liked about Baldur's Gate was that I understood the mechanics. It was all based on second edition D&D. &D. But most RPGs that we probably play today have a fairly hidden... You could go to Hawkwind while we're here if you want to see if we've... Uh, Done anything good with our riches? So, would you like to know the mechanics in an RPG, or do you like it hidden from you? Uh, computer, or yeah, actually either. What about um, tabletop? Is it better if you have a DM who's if you play a new game like Fate or something? You're like, I don't mind. Like, so trying to play. Uh, God, what was that? What's the Cyberpunk fantasy. Shadowrun? Shadowrun. Um, you know, I didn't feel the. I didn't have the time mm -hmm. to go through all those yeah. rules. So I'm glad that. You know, and I don't mind that. DD, uh, I. Because yeah, I've. I think part of what I. Why I'm doing what I'm doing now is because I had access to those rules. You know, I think they're very interesting. I think that it's fun to know them only because it makes it more compelling to manipulate things or break things. Yeah. I'm more inclined to do that with computer games than with, with tabletop role playing games. There's a much more sacred kind of. <laughs> well, it's, if you see somebody sitting in front of you, do you have a more we're cooperating to make a fun game? Mechanic than when you play a game that's a computer game, you feel like you're competing against them. Yeah, I think might be in there, but it's interesting to me because I was thinking, I feel like when I know the mechanics, at least on the tactical level, maybe not on the role playing level, but when it comes to combat, I like knowing the mechanics. Um, I don't know why. Well, I think what makes it interesting, and I, I haven't read play anything, but a lot of this does come from Bogos. Um, alien phenomenology and mm -hmm. this concept of carpentry and you know y making philosophy mm -hmm. I mean that's a very I mean I think doing that through mechanics like it's interesting to me to play first edition or second edition D&D &D because you have this comparison the fifth or where we're at now what does that say when we have uh, charts and for ta and horse tack and Right, right, right. <laughs> and a lot of those things have gone by the wayside. Yeah. You know, we we focus more on narrative with fifth edition, right? Right. Um, but even thinking about how combat is, I don't even like. I don't, I'm not, I'm not particularly interested in in combat. I'm more interested in leveling up. Like huh. this is interesting to me. Yeah. Like why we have to go to get the blessing right, of right, right. King Lord Britain to level up. Well, I mean, again, we, you know, we, I mean, fifth edition versus first edition. So, my first edition group, we, are the, we have an extremely vibrant, and I, I want to go back to play anything. I bought play anything the day that it came out, and I read the first like four um, sentences, and this is, this is my fault. And the f one sentence says, Ian Bogos wrote, "I would never suggest that life is, you know, life is too serious a thing to suggest that it's something that we play." And as soon as I read that, I threw the book across the room. I mentioned this to my students the other day. Because that's the basis of all my work, is the idea that, and, and I love Ian Bogos, um, despite the fact that, you know, so much of what he writes is, as I mentioned before, academic trolling. 
Um, but I think it's good. You know, I think all the questions that he poses are always fascinating. I don't necessarily always come to the same conclusions, but it's my fault that I haven't read Play Anything because I'm sure that it probably does have a lot of good insights. But currently, in my first edition game, we've been talking a lot about how rules shape narratives and you know, how mechanics do as well. And this all came up from one of my one of my players, a good friend of mine, and he's was ta he was just like we we had been we just finished a, a module where the, the group has walked out of a dungeon with a good haul of equipment, magical equipment and gold. In a first edition D and D, and if you know, it's not true in second edition anymore. All experience is based on how much gold you can mm -hmm. bring out of a the dungeon, which you know again amplifies this mechanic that the players are you know. You know, it's it's a colossal cave mechanic. Go into a dungeon, take every, take all the indigenous people's stuff, and leave them. Um, <laughs> in this case, of course, I shouldn't say indigenous. That's not the right word. But you know, the, I don't know what the right word is. Um, it's an imperialist mechanic. I, I sound like I'm being ridiculous. Um, my point was, he was like, you know, one of the cool things about D and D is how much it makes you worry about encumbrance and how that actually impacts the way that you kind of look at the game. He's like, we need to get better about the incumbents rules. And I've been kind of letting it slide as the DM just because, I one, I trusted my players, and two, in the middle of the session, it's not always the most glamorous thing to do mm -hmm. to suddenly figure out. But he's like, no, he's like, this actually has a huge impact on the way that d and is kind of set up. Um, the idea of, like, well, you've got to drop the torch if you want to pick that up. And, you know, if somebody has a bag of holding, even then it only covers, like, 200 gold pieces. There's still really tough decisions, tactical, I suppose, decisions, or strategic, not tactical, strategic decisions that you have to make about what you're going to hold um, that makes the game, that I think uh, reinforces a theme in the game around, uh, about hard decisions, around mm -hmm. like material wealth that you're kind of... And it's funny that I mentioned Colossal Cave Adventure because Zork and Colossal Cave Adventure, half of their puzzles are, are based on what can you pick up <laughs> and take to the end at the same time and w how can you get them through there's a great puzzle in Zork if I don't remember if I'm remembering correctly where it's a painting and you can't take the painting the way that you came so you have to build like a rope I think in the gallery the, um, my memory's a little it's been a while since I played the first Zork but you have to make a rope to bring the painting up to get a, you have to find you know another way to get it through that's something that I think D&D &D does in some ways yeah. you know, Gary Gygax had a quotation once where she said defeating the monster should be easy Figuring out how to get all the gold out should be hard. And again, it's he's being facetious. Sorry to go off on a tangent on that. But yeah. with mechanics and how they influence narrative and how they influence how you think about the game, we talk about that a lot in my first edition game, but my pushback is always the DM and the players always complicate the rules. You know, there yeah. is no one, despite what Uncle Gary would tell you, there is no just one first edition game. And because every DM, DM changes it based on what the players want and the DM wants. So mm -hmm. how much can mechanics influence? I don't know. We tend to play. We play my first edition game fairly by the books, by the rule books, because, one, we're all doing it in many ways out of curiosity about first edition, despite yeah. the fact we all grew up on it. <laughs> we never played it correctly when we were... Never oh. correctly, again, that's Uncle Gary talking. But we never played it by the book when we were 10. And now we're trying to, to mm -hmm. see what we can learn. I'll shut up now. Yeah, I... I certainly never played first edition by the rules. I mean, uh, looking back, it was a bunch of goofballs sitting in a basement, just kind of like staring at the books blankly, um, and everyone kind of dishing on the DM because mm -hmm. he was about as naive as his players. Uh, yeah, yeah. I've Nick's bringing up a lot of uh, points. The idea of computation influencing an arcade like feel um yeah I mean these are all good questions we should bring these up next time because these are all good questions and I'm really curious about yeah about automating so then oh no it's, uh, that the uh, secret of that book is actually making the argument that life is not serious I think this is one of the central the problems I have with Bogos and a lot of uh game scholars and especially object oriented scholars it seems is this uh, very easy for a uh, middle aged white man to yeah yeah to argue and I you know well it's still uh, a game because some of us have more pieces than particular others I suppose um, yeah yeah I mean um, I don't know 
I do. Think I, I wrestle with that. Like as someone yeah. who has has spoken a lot about using games in the classroom, I find it really hard to to uh, defend that. Defend the idea that you know making things playful. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, I don't know. I, don't think, know. I, I enjoy. I try not to take things as seriously, but uh-huh. again, that's a that's a luxury that I have. Wow, I don't. That's a good question. That's all mine. That's an existential question, almost. You know, um, I mean, I do too. But again, we're coming from a similar ethnographic. I think. Ah, there is no magic circle. <laughs> <laughs> I want to. Well, it's funny because I mean, you know, I'm teaching this class in game culture right now too, and. Yeah, you know, it's always it's always the um, all we're always it's always easy to diss. It's always easy to be critical of high circles, out, right? Oh Jesus! <laughs> <laughs> you can make the, I mean, you can make either point, but, I, but it's funny. The more I read Hisenga, the more I'm like, oh, that kind of makes sense. Uh, I I really like like there was a a bit. There's something about going back to Heisinga and Kaiwa and all that early play theory that's a lot of fun. But mm-hmm. it's also good to see how far we've come from that. Um, there's only magic circles. Someone's been on, someone misses Google Plus, I think. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, I think I could come around. <sighs> yeah. yeah, but we have. Uh, Rhetorics of play, shit. Ian Bogos is what no. procedural rhetoric. No, oh no, ambiguity of play is what I'm thinking of. Right. Um. I was just gonna mention. That I was gonna go back to the you know the arcadey feel. I thought it was really interesting this um, arcadey feel of tabletop that we've automated so much stuff. I was thinking that this, you know, Red Dead Redemption, which just came out this week, and one of the things I think is super cool that you can do in Red Dead Redemption. Is turn off the HUD, right? The uh, you know the little radar screen that shows you where your next quest Sutton is. Smith, thank you. See, you, got, you guys have a better academic vocabulary than I do. Oh, that's be, that's only because people. I had an advisor who was all about Rutten, Sutton Smith, Dyer Witherford, and um, I can't remember the other one. Anyway, sorry. No worries. I was just gonna say I thought it was right, automated tabletop, I, and I need to learn these names. Um, <laughs> is that you know, in Red Dead Redemption, you can now turn the HUD off in the middle of the game. And what's fascinating to me, this is hearsay from somebody who just picked up this game, told me that it then changes the dialogue. So if you get a quest and put that, you know, it's Red Dead Redemption, so it's a Western, but there's still quests. If somebody says, hey, I need you to go, you know, save this ranch, they give you directions to the ranch instead of just saying, go to the ranch, you know, mm-hmm. go to Bonnie McFarland's ranch and suddenly it's on your, you know, it's on your radar screen. They'll actually say, go, you know, go to the tree, Take a left, follow that path for a while. It's like that's that's brilliant. I mean, we've all heard me, I think, a few times on this channel talk about you know my Morrowind as being one of my favorite RPGs of all time, and one of those things is the fact, of course, that there is no quest marker system in that yeah. game at all. Um, everything is done by trying to find it, and because they did such a great job in Morrowind of having a fair number of emergent narratives, if I can rip off Henry Jenkins to show that I know somebody. Um, because you kept running into strange stuff while you're trying to find out where you should be going. Somewhat that I think happens in Ultima 4. Yeah, I might... Uh, <laughs> we picked up Red Dead Redemption 2, and I've only watched um, Noah play it. Um, I want to play it so bad. Yes. I'm, I'm a huge fan of Rockstar. There are a lot of reasons to dislike them. Their practices, I don't want to get into any of that. Yeah. But as far as the game is concerned, Grand Theft Auto V kind of showed, and not not in a good way. And then when I say fan, I mean like an academic fan. It's a great, ob- you know, they they make good games to sit there and talk about. Uh huh. And at Red Dead Redemption Two, my one of the first things I asked was, do they allow you to take pictures in Red Dead Redemption Two or like screenshots? Because that's very important to Rockstar Games. Mm-hmm. So when you're saying, I didn't know that you could get remove the HUD, and he, he, my son showed me that, oh yeah, they've got like an old camera that yeah. you can take photos, because what they want you to do, I mean, these are no longer games, these are these well, are worlds that yeah. they want you to spend a lot of time in. Grand Theft Auto V has not left 
the list of top 10 best selling games now it's been out like 4 or 5 years and it's funny because I won't play I won't if you talk about yeah I was going to go off and Wait, I never played I never played Grand Theft Auto the, I, I've never I think I've completed one mission it's more interesting to like hop on the train and ride around town right it's a wonderful I mean but that's the problem is is that this so called you know emergent play mm. is now being co-opted into the game well th- I mean it's, it, this is how Facebook makes its money right make the people that use your service create the content for you I mean yeah. but it's not but it's not but I mean so was Ultima Online right um <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I put about 40, 50 hours, and I, I don't know if you ever came across me when I was streaming Grand Theft Auto. Um, online, I, I was like, you know, I'm not doing online. I actually went on once, and it was about as chaotic as I... It was absolutely marvelous. It was more effort to just avoid being seen. You, know, you could, couldn't do anything that I was there to do. I feel like we have the weirdest... Yeah. But... You know, that is where you see just that weird... But it's all... It's all people-driven. It's all player-driven. And yeah. that's not... I don't know. It's... Uh, Grand Theft Online is... I haven't played... I, mean, I mean, I haven't played Grand Theft Online. I so I was going to... I mean, this is a digression, but I won't buy Grand Theft Auto Five because I'm so disturbed by just the level of, like, kind of disgusting violence that they put in the game. And that doesn't mean that I won't play it. Mm-hmm. And be like, all right, you know, as an adult, hopefully I can understand it. But it's like, I, I actually thought they went too. I really fuddy duddy these games. The other day we were talking about playing Hotline Miami for the for this thing. I was like, man, I can't play that. It's, it's too, too far for me. But um, my point was, I've always been saying I'm gonna buy it when I can find a used copy, so I don't feel like I'm giving money <laughs> to Rockstar, um, which is it is absurd. It is my little. It's it is, it is, it is absurd viewpoint, especially because I'll probably buy Red Dead Redemption and give them money anyway. Um, well, it's like with your three. I mean, especially if you have kids. I mean, this becomes a concern. I mean, and it's not to, like with your three. My son asked if he could play it, and mm-hmm. I said, I said flat out, no. He said, well, I, and he turned seventeen. He asked me again, can I play? I said, no. Please understand that the thought of me, I, I just, I can't stand the thought of walking into your room, you playing with your three, and seeing some of the things that I know are on that game in front of you. Mm. I said, I know it's not fair. I know this is just not cool. But I just, I can't, please understand my perspective on this. He said the same thing about Game of Thrones. Mm-hmm. Like, no, you can't watch that while you're in the house. Hmm. There's no, uh, and I'm not a, I, I don't consider myself a fuddy daddy. Yeah, sure, right. It's purely the, the thought of, like, watching my children watch some of the things that I've seen. Are you more worried about the violence or the sexual The content? violence, it's always the sexual content. That bothers you. The violence, I have no problem with. I have no problem with. I think that stuff is hysterical. Why? See, that's so weird. When I, I grew up in a household where I was allowed. I was never allowed to see violence, but like it was to the point that like sometimes I was like, I don't really need to see this. Yeah, we, um, we're well, we loved. We loved horror and gory things. Uh-huh. So this is all kind of fi- falls into that shtick. Well, how does this stuff I, fall into your shtick then? I mean, it's still video. Games because it's games. it's. I'm being a devil's advocate. Because it's too. sexuality being used. For well, it was I can't remember the term. Uh-huh. I was raised by my, primarily by my mother, and so that was the type of thing that's objectifying women. That type of stuff. When you're using sexuality to kind of promote things, maybe next week I can talk about why mm-hmm. that's different. From <laughs> right. <laughs> gr- gratuitous, you know, gratuitous sex for the sake of, you know, in Witcher, it, Witcher three, it's just like, oh God. I mean, come on, we don't need any of this garbage. You just don't need it. Um, See, I, I don't know. That's interesting. I mean, I, it is. It is interesting to me. And again, I can't. I have no idea how I'm going to be when I, you know, say my kids are seventeen. Um, well, it's like Fortnite had boob mechanics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My kid knew about yeah. it before I did. And he was just like, "Oh, if by the time he got home, I was the one going, oh, did you hear about this?'" And he says, "Yeah, uh, but they've already fixed it." <laughs> yeah. Nick is no, no Nick is down on Witcher. Fallout and The Witcher. Um, you know, but what I like about Witcher is is the the engine. You know, the story's boring. Um, wh- what's interesting to me is the the what they're doing with graphics. They're making more a more compelling world to stay in. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I but the game itself, yeah, it's not really. Partic- 
particularly interesting. And that's just it. It's like, why would you want? Why would my seventeen-year-old want to play Witcher Three? Well, I it's think it's not because of the the way the grass blows in the wind, or hair physics. It's it's because it's got this reputation, and it's it's like, eh. no, it's got. Well, I remember when I was fourteen years old and trying to find a pirated copy of Leisure Suit Larry was the oh, extent yeah. of like what you could find that was slightly risque. Uh, you could also find, you know, I remember on bulletin board systems, you could find ASCII coins, which would be literally oh, yeah. like a, you know, literally using nothing more than the, uh, you know, the, you know, the, the plus sign and the end sign. <laughs> you could make a uh, <laughs> dwarf fortress. Someday I I said we should play dwarf fortress for one of the things, and I. I'm never going to play Dwarf Fortress. I, I, well, I will, actually. I shouldn't say that. But it's too difficult to figure out. Someone just remade their... Speaking dwarf, of ASCII, by the way. Someone made their Dwarf Fortress fortress in Minecraft. Because why not? I don't know. I... Uh, I what did we mean? I don't know. Let's see, now I, I need more explanation on that. What does G tool mean? I don't know what I'm talking about. Everyone else knows more than me. Dwarf Fortress for Minecraft. G tool. What does that mean? I've read more about Dwarf Fortress than I have ever. Oh, tool. Uh, I thought this was like some cool coding mechanic. I'll use the G tool. But which is the tool then, Dwarf Fortress or Minecraft? My guess is Minecraft. So I had mine. So my game culture class this week, I asked them to do. It was funny that we're talking about sexuality and and, and violence in video games. And it, I, I'm sort of, I, it's interesting to me that you have less of a problem with the violence because that's literally like I wouldn't. I would not let my kid play Grand Theft Auto. Right? I mean, I don't, again, I don't have teenage kids, so we'll see how it goes when when mm -hmm. we get to that point. Um, Oh, there's an okay, okay. Hmm. That's interesting. Comprendo. So I asked my I asked my students this week to do one to do two things. They had to play or uh, play or watch both Doom and Minecraft, like separately. And they the original. The I I said they could play the 2016. The 2016 version of Doom isn't much different than the 1995 or 93 93 version of Doom. Um, but we were reading a section from Engenveld Nielsen at all about the practice of games, active media versus active user versus magic circle thoughts, you know, is, is it the player that controls how the game impacts them, does the game have an effect on it, you know, how does the game impact somebody, um, you know, are the magic circles the end of something and leave it, and so I, I just wanted them to, I, just, I was like, play both of these games and tell me how you feel after you play them, you know, like, did it have an impact on you, and um, some of the discussions were really, really fascinating in that class. Um, I mean, I chose the two kind of games I felt were kind of opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, and I don't even, I don't know. I don't even know where I'm going with that. I don't know. I, I guess it, the the violence has always been part of computer games. But it's just less abstract <laughs> now, vis aesthetically. I think I've told this, this story, I, and maybe we've even talked about it on the draw. I will never forget, I was just talking about this with my wife the other day, I will never forget... Dad and mother. Yeah. Yeah, where's the... I had another name for this, but we should roll the note. Um, it's uh, Thomas. Thomas needs to be here for that one. Yeah. Um, issue, my father had an, uh, a subscription to, I think it was Mac Play or something like that. And, or no, I think it was Byte Magazine, like going way back in the mm. day. So it was, for, it was about Apple Computer. I think they became Mac something. And it, there was this guy named, his name was Scott Adams. I, th I think his name was Scott Adams. And no relation to either the Dilbert guy, nor the guy who created Inter Adventure International. This was yet another Scott Adams. And he, it was called Adams on Games. And so he did a review of, of games for like the Apple II every month. And he was reviewing Fantasy P Fantasy 3 was the game. And I don't know if you remember Fantasy 3. The graphics don't look too much different than Ultima 4. And um, S it was SSIs before they launched the Gold Box games. It was one of their hmm. one of their kind of D and D games. I actually I owned it. I ended Fantasy two or three, and I really loved it. It was a really fun game. Had some great mechanics, but the mechanic that Scott Adams brought up, and so he was criticizing uh, Fantasy three for the fact that you, your little characters had little 
um, again, we're talking about the 1980s, so very basic um, wireframes, right? Well, if your character got hit, it actually would say, you've got hit, hit in the arm. And so I think, like a hangman almost, your arm might disappear, right? Oh, mm -hmm. So you can no longer use, use your right arm to carry your sword. And Scott Adams said, the grisly brutality of this conception <laughs> would will inevitably cause mothers to pull this game away from their children. And he said, and he went on like again a good like four sentences talking about how he couldn't believe games had gone to this length of depravity yeah. of showing a hangman's arm that's beating on. He's like just thinking of children thinking about limbs being hacked off and heads being hacked <laughs> off. It's so you know, discourages you know, that I cannot recommend this game. Oh, wow. so I think now I always think about that article whenever I see a segment from Grand Theft Auto. But for you, you know, I. The one game, and I thought that I... Nick's on his way out. I wanted to say thank you, Nick, for, for being here and for all of the stuff that you shared with us. Today. Yeah, as always, Nick, it's uh, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, we'll be here tomorrow at noon, I think. Um, yeah, my son rented Mortal Kombat, the new one, and I've never been interested in any of those games. Mm -hmm. They're just too boring. And I plus I'm terrible at them, um, and I just I was really curious to see how they pushed the limits, and it was it got it was violent to the point where at first it was like oh yeah this is like kung fu movie stuff like over the top, yeah. but then it just got nauseating. It was just like whoa, and you know I ended up telling him, okay you can play this. Don't do any of those fatalities while the mother's in the room. <laughs> <laughs> and he did it once. She's like, "What is this?" I'm like, "Dang it, Elijah!" <laughs> it. Yeah, I watched the YouTube of all of them once, and I was like, "I was curious," you know. And I was like, oh. "These must be so bad." I was like, "Wow, that is that is even beyond." And there, well, I, I mean, they're specifically made to yeah. upset parents, right? I mean, that's the thing. Yeah. Like, they're going out of their way to. I mean, it's and see, that's the thing. Like Grand Theft Auto Five, I I would not let my children play it because mm -hmm. the only reason they want to play it is for the violence, is for because of what they've heard. It's yeah, not any. Yeah, 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 yeah. It has nothing to do with any quality besides what teenagers are, want to see in a game. I'm just yeah. not interested in, in contributing to that. Same with I mean, my my brother. We're helping him move, and I he's read all the Game of Thrones books, and I relayed this to him he says make him read the books first the books are better and you know if, if that if it's if he's still interested in watching the show after that mm -hmm. well then by all means that's that's a great point but the, but the, I don't know see that's a long again it's 234 and I need to be working but I, that is a can of worms to open up right so you're saying that the, the message in a literary medium is more is less dangerous and more you know useful because it's in a different medium, and I, I don't know if I buy that. I think um, it's more work, though, because it, like I started reading the Game of Thrones books, having watched a couple seasons of the show, and I was not interested in reading the books any longer because yeah. it focused on, it was like spelling out the the politics, which is interesting in the right. show, very quickly digested. Um, well, my wife has read all the books and watched all of the show. I have, and she tells me that there's no reason to read the books because they take out all of the stuff that's just completely superfluous and not interesting in the, in the show. Yeah, well, that's, and I think that's what he was saying. It's like, if you're de that dedicated to the books, then you can, then you have, <laughs> you've earned the right to watch <laughs> the show or something. I don't know, I mean. I don't know, I think it's an interesting question, though. Like, I, I don't know, I mean, it comes back to the valorization of, of literature, and as somebody who loves books as much as I do, I, I don't necessarily have a problem with that on some angles, but it, we do, we do. I mean, I don't know. Do, does that impact the way that we make games or movies? Because we expect less from them to be serious, so then we create shit. Um, well, my problem was I was reading the book, and all I could think of, I just I couldn't separate it from the TV yeah, yeah, show. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I have, you know, you know what it's like when you have the characters already embedded in yeah. your head, and it's like yep. this is. I hate. I hate that. I feeling. wish I had never watched a Harry Potter. I'd, you know, read the four was through the first four or five Harry Potter books, and saw the movies. You know, up to the fourth book or whatever, and then the rest of the damn books, they all look like Rupert Grint and uh, <laughs> you know Emma Watson and uh, 
Yeah. What's the name of the guy who plays Harry Potter? But anyway, I couldn't see anyone else. And my, of course, my, you know, in, in my head, they look completely different to some degree. I thought Rupert Green was actually a pretty good casting. Anyway, should we wrap up before we continue to just end up talking about? This is still better.